our colleague Elliot Bledsoe. Um, and I would just firstly like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people um, of the custodians of the land where I'm joining today from Canberra and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Elliot, do you want to introduce yourself? You're on mute, if that helps. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thanks, Sarah. I would also like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Yagara people as the traditional custodians of the land where I'm joining from today. Uh, kia ora koutou. I'm Kim Gritschlag. I'm here on behalf of the Lianza Standing Committee on Copyright. So, um, yes, Thank you very much for your interest in this subject and for joining us on the webinar. So we've got quite a lot to get through because copyright's never something that's really short. So um, can everyone see um, the screen I'm sharing? Is that all good? Good, right. Just I can't see the screen I'm sharing. Right, now I can. And I'm really pleased that um, Elliot and Sarah have joined me from um, over the ditch, it'll be really great having their input as well. So what we are going to cover today are the exceptions for research or private study, the educational exceptions in the Act. Um, Sarah's going to talk about educational licensing and um, Elliot's going to bravely talk about AI in schools. And then thank you again for everyone who supplied scenarios. We're going to go through those scenarios at the end and hopefully we'll get through it all. Uh, we are not covering the library exceptions. Um, I think we said in the in the advertisement for this that if you needed to brush up on those, because you have access to those as well as the educational exceptions, you need to check out the Lianza Copyright Basics webinar, which is on the Lianza um, webinar site. So just before we get right into the the weeds of the exceptions, a little bit about terminology. So the Copyright Act talks about educational establishments and for the purposes of the Copyright Act, all schools in New Zealand are um, educational establishments. So the educational exceptions apply to you. Um, the other thing the Act talks about a lot is fair dealing. It also talks about reasonable proportion. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't define this. And I think the main thing to say about this is that people think there's a 10% rule, but there isn't. So the best advice we can give you in thinking about when it says fair dealing is OK, is you need to consider the amount and substantiality of what you are copying in relation to the whole work. So example, if you copied a whole short story from a collection of short stories, you'd be copying the whole work. So that's not fair dealing because each story itself is a work. Um, we would suggest that you think about whether what you want to copy captures the kind of pith and essence of the work. And if it does, it's unlikely that it would be considered fair dealing. Another thing that you need to consider is whether the work could have been obtained at a reasonable price and a reasonably um, at an ordinary commercial price. The education exceptions obviously talk about instruction and in the course of instruction, which means um, basically giving or receiving a lesson, which can be alone or as a group, it can be in person or it can be by correspondence. Even though we're not going to touch on the library exceptions, um, the Act does talk about prescribed libraries and those are the libraries that um, the library exceptions apply to. And um, for your sake, you need to know that all school libraries are prescribed libraries under the Act. OK, so the first couple of exceptions we'll look at are the exceptions for research and study. These are basically personal copying. So under section 42, section 42 is actually about criticism and review and news reporting, but we're putting news reporting aside. So this is really about yeah criticism, review. You can copy fair dealing again, that undefined thing. So it's really a limited quotation for kind of criticism and review. You need to um, acknowledge the use of the work. So proper citation and, and things like that. Section 43 allows um, a copy, again, a fair dealing amount, so not defined. 
So a reasonably small amount, not the pith and essence of the work that's made by an individual for their own use. So this can be any type of work for this purposes, but this is not multiple copying. This is copying by the individual for their own use. So this would be copying by a student or a teacher for their own use. It's absolutely about single copying. As a librarian, you can also do limited copying for um, people on their behalf, but that would actually be done under one of the library exceptions in section 51 of this one. Right, onto the core of the educational exceptions, which are sections 44 to 49. Um, these can broadly be grouped under four kind of headings, and I will take you through each one of them in course. So copying and storing copies, performing, playing or showing works, communicating digital works, and things done to support examinations. So we'll take a look at each of those in turn. Section 44.1 is allows it's quite generous it allows the whole of a work to be copied or part of a work it's copying that's done by the person or on behalf of the person who is giving the lesson it's only applies to literary dramatic musical or artistic works or typographical arrangements so um, audio visual material is not part of this this is done um, on by the person or on behalf of the person giving a lesson. It's only one copy and it is absolutely for preparing for or giving a lesson. So it's not about communicating those copies to students. You can't put a copy up and tell students to copy it. You can't place it on an intranet. You can't email it. This is about the teacher making a copy that helps them prepare and give the lesson. Where you need multiple copies of a, of a work or part of a work, for example, a handout for class or something, your options are given the act is quite old now. It still talks about copying by hand, which obviously none of us are going to do these days. If you're going to use a reprographic means to copy, then you can do 3%, up to 3% or three pages of a work, whichever is greater. So that's not a lot. And actually, if the 3% or three pages is more than half the work, um, you can't do more than half the work. So um, basically, when you want multiple copying, your options really are to do that copying under license. And Sarah will be talking about the educational licenses a little bit later. If you are using the exceptions in the Act to do multiple copying, so to do that 3%, um, there are some conditions that apply to that. So you can't make a charge for students when you give them multiple copies. Um, part of that work, that work cannot be copied at your institution again for another 14 days, and you can't as I said before, communicate these copies, which means, you know, um, put it on an intranet, email it to people, whatever. But you can store the copies. Um, section 43, 44, 3 and 6 are a bit weirdly worded, and they seem to allow for successive copying of the 3% or three pages of a work, provided that there's a 14-day interval between the copying and that all the other requirements of section 44 are met. So that's a bit weird and one I think that the people will be looking to fix that up when they look at the Copyright Act again. So the copying that we've just talked about is um, of those literary works, um, the artistic works, uh, the dramatic works, the typographical works. What if you want to do um, audiovisual works, films, sound recordings, communication works, TV and radio broadcasts? Here, the Act is a lot less helpful to us. Um, Section 45 does allow some copying of those, but it's limited usefulness because it can only be done for a course about how to make films or film soundtracks. Again, the copying would have to be done by or on behalf of the teacher or the student giving the lesson, and there can be no charge made for the copies. So this one is a very limited um, provision and probably not much use to most schools. 
Again, there is provision in section 45 for copying from sound recordings, but again, it's limited to language learning lessons or lessons conducted by correspondents. So the same sort of conditions apply. And there is a, a caveat here that says this whole section doesn't apply if there's a license available. And in New Zealand, there is a license available for this sort of work. Section 48 does the same for communication works, which is um, like TV and radio broadcasts. Again, it's not that use as an, useful as an exception because if there's a license available and the educational establishment knows that and they are well publicised licences, this does not apply. It has to be done through licensing. Section 44A allows uh, schools to copy, store a copy of page or pages from a work that's made available on a website, provided that they meet the conditions here. So it's displayed under a separate frame or identifier. The author and source of the work is identified clearly. The name of the educational institution and the date that the work was stored is there, and that it's only accessible by authorised users who go through a verification system. So a secure authentication system to get through to where the work has been stored by the educational establishment. It also has to be deleted once it's no longer relevant for the course that it was used for. Section 46 allows um, for anthologies for educational use. So this is really short passages from published works. There are some conditions here. So one of the conditions is that the work was not intended by the publisher for use in an educational establishment. So if there's definitely a sort of core textbook that's not allowed to be copied in here, it excludes computer programs. The anthology sort of consists mainly of material that's out of copyright or for which there's no license needed. There has to be acknowledgement. And there are some quite complex conditions, which I'm not going to go into, for um, preventing the inclusion of too many extracts of a work by the same author and the same publisher. Section 47 allows schools to um, perform, play or show literary, dramatic or music works in the course of activities of the educational institution. So this is, again, hedged around by conditions. It's got to be for the purposes of instruction, the performances by students or staff members. The audience can only be staff, students and people directly connected with the educational establishments. So this can't be a performance in front of parents or guardians. Oh, I should have said there as well that section 47 also allows um, the playing or um, showing of a sound recording, a film or a communication work, again, for the purposes of instruction and again to that same audience, so not to parents, not to guardians, just to staff, students and people closely connected with, this, with the activities of the school. Probably the most generous of the educational provisions is the um, one that supports the purposes of examination. So, Copying of anything can be done for setting the questions, communicating the questions to candidates, or answering the questions, which I find quite a weird statement. Um, but it is only for the purposes of examination. So while this is quite wide and generous as an exception, it is very much limited to just examinations. So that was a um, quick go through the educational exceptions. So now I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who's going to talk about educational licenses. Thanks, Kim. So um, this next section that I will cover explores what schools can copy under educational licenses. And in some cases, these licenses top up the educational exceptions that Kim has um, just gone through. Um, as can mention, some of those exceptions, um, and if you have a license, you cannot rely on them. Um, so the licenses that I'll talk about are opt uh, on an opt-in basis. 
So uh, it will pay to just check with your school if you have a current license before relying on any of this information. But this is more of just a general overview of what's available. And um, for each specific school, just recommend going to just check it out. Uh, next slide, please. So firstly, what is a copyright license? It's generally where a copyright owner grants permission, usually in writing, uh, to use the copyrighted work under specific terms. So the terms could range from the type of use um, to how long the license will last for and some other conditions as well. But uh, and next, next slide. The three educational licenses that New Zealand has, three main ones, uh, are the Copyright Licensing New Zealand CLNZ license, CLNZ for short. This allows you to co copy from printed published works and I'll go through each license and kind of specify exactly what you can copy and how much and how you can share. Uh, there's also the Screen Rights license which allows you to copy from television and radio broadcasts as well. And then there's the One Music license which allows you to copy and perform musical works uh, within within the school and the New Zealand School Trustees Association has um, you can purchase all three of the licenses through their website so it's kind of like a one-stop shop all the licenses if you don't have them and you need them okay thanks Kim So the CLNZ license, what can you copy? It's any hard copy material from a printed book, journal or magazine, a scanned or digital copy of an original printed version, and any overseas and local newspapers from digital and print, both digital and print content. So it is quite broad. And how much can you copy? This is where the 10% rule comes in, which I think people get a bit confused about, but if you have the CLNZ license, you can copy up to 10% of work or one chapter of a book. So whichever is greater, and that includes pictures and graphs as well. You can copy up to 15 pages from books of short stories and poetry or complete magazine and journal articles. So you can copy one per issue, but more if it's on the same subject. So there's a little bit of leeway there. And you can also copy up to five newspaper articles per issue from overseas and local newspapers uh, on from online or hard copies as well. And how can you share this material? You can share it in most of the usual ways. So you can print it out in class, you can use it in worksheets, you can share it through interactive whiteboards or the learning management system. Um, so password protected class web pages or a reading list software. You can also send it via PDF um, or embed it in a PDF in an email as well. A lot of teachers, I don't think. Uh, know that you can do that. So, um, and just one note, just before we move on, is that these licenses um, I have in my, one of my previous jobs as a copyright officer at Auckland University of Technology. My job was to manage the CLNZ license for the university, and I can tell you that the money where we can identify an author where a work has been used and it can be identified that um, you can identify the author, the money will go back. From CLNZ to the author. So it is actually a great way to distribute the funds back to authors as well. Um, and it's the same with the other two licenses too. So that's the main premise behind having these licenses is um, to distribute those funds back for the use of the work. So screen rights license, that's it's also very broad. You can copy any program, movies, documentaries, Maori language programs, news, current affairs from anywhere. You can make you can even make copies in your home or the library from any channel, pay or free to air, and any legally available audiovisual material as well. So podcasts or programs on the internet or radio programs. Um, there are a couple of limitations on that, so just I would double check. There's a whole lot of really good information on the Screen Rights uh, website if you do have a very specific question and you can't quite um, 
you're not quite sure, they will be able to help you. And you can copy it into any, onto any format as well to use in teaching or to keep in the library as a resource. So that license is pretty uh, broad. Oh, next. And the One Music license is also very broad. You can copy virtually all commercially released music from anywhere in the world for all educational uses and many typical school uses, which includes events. So um, if you've got like a school musical or a play, I think my, sorry, my video has stopped working. Hold on. Uh, if you've got celebrations or fundraisers, etc., um, there's actually a, a very detailed guide on their website that I recommend checking out if you do have any questions around music. Uh, this is just a very general look at it. Um, oh, and now I think we will hand you on to Elliot. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, certainly, as somebody not from New Zealand, it's really interesting to see the differences and the similarities with the Australian uh, educational exceptions and have to see how they, that plays out, uh, as uh, as Tim said, across the ditch. Um, really, this part is designed to talk a little bit about the, uh, I guess, the, the elephant in the room that is AI, uh, and in particular, to think about uh, AI in the context of uh, use within schools and teaching uh, institutions. Now, in many ways, this is a very large topic, uh, and the idea of doing this as a section of a webinar probably fairly futile. It's probably the subject of many webinars in and of itself. So I'm not going to go through a lot of the kind of technical or legal detail around copyright and AI, but rather talk more broadly about uh, the potential and the possible pitfalls of AI within a teaching context. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the idea of AI may seem like it's really come up in the last sort of 18 months or so, uh, particularly with the release of a number of uh, consumer orientated generative AI products like uh, ChatGPT, DALI, uh, Google Bard, et cetera. But actually, AI has been around for a really long time. Uh, it's it's about 30 or 40 years old in terms of its concept of, as a technology. And even in more recent times, we've seen AI used to do certain things. So, for example, if you haven't seen or read about it, the new Rembrandt project from, I think it was 2017, somewhere around there, 2016, 2017, was a process of using AI to analyze and understand the body of, uh, of artwork by Rembrandt to see if it could produce a Rembrandt style artwork, uh, which is what you can see on screen. Uh, I'm not going to look at that project in detail, but if it's something that's of interest to you, it's definitely worth having a look. There's a very good website, thenewrembrandt.com, that looks at a lot of the uh, concept and the process of developing that work, including the fact that the work is uh, three-dimensional, so it's it's attempted to emulate the brushstroke and textural style, not just the visual style. But if you're interested in the new Rembrandt, definitely look it up because we don't have time to look at that because it's probably the subject of a webinar in and of itself. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of thinking about uh, AI and copyright in schools, uh, I think there's a number of different ways that we can uh, begin to explore the possibility of AI in a teaching context. In particular, one of the ones that you'll see talked about a fair bit is the ability for generative AI products, particularly uh, text-based ones like ChatGPT or visual-based ones like DALI, uh, Midjourney, etc., is the ability to quickly generate resources that can be used for teaching and learning. Uh, so based on uh, a kind of prompt design or prompt architecture where you're telling the system the type of things that you want, uh, it can fairly quickly generate you some kind of response, whether or not that's uh, exactly what you need or whether that requires further, uh, you know, refinement of the prompts is another question. But at least in theory, it can give you largely what you want relatively quickly, right? So if you wanted to say, um, 
write me a comparative analysis of the copyright exceptions for education between Australia and New Zealand, it could generate you that relatively quickly. I strongly recommend that you fact check it, but it could definitely generate you some kind of a comparison. So there's definitely the ability to uh, create resources fairly quickly. In extending that or thinking further about that, the real potential of AI is to do that in a um, an ongoing real-time and iterative basis. So the ability, for example, to be able to quite easily personalize and customize those training resources to meet the certain needs of particular students uh, or, or uh, learners that are participating in a course, right? So uh, if you're able, for example, to feed in certain data about the student, you can then actually use that to design uh, specific responses from the AI that you know, it's more aligned with the the needs or interests or uh, whatever of the, the student that you're talking about. It also, of course, lends itself to more interactive and innovative ways of teaching. For example, the use of what, what's often kind of referred to as an AI chatbot or similar sort of service where it's a series of ongoing uh, exchanges, I guess, uh, between you and the AI in a fairly conversational format can be a really dynamic and interesting way of teaching information to students, um, you know, in, in a different format to say, uh, maybe more classic models of teaching. Um, there's also a lot of potential in terms of being able to uh, ingest large bodies of data to understand and identify patterns in that data to bring forth analysis of what that data is seeming to indicate to uh, identify the kinds of trends uh, that are emerging through that data and use that as a part of a, a, a continual improvement process for uh, you know thinking about designing uh, educational experiences. And of course, all of this kind of put together massively increases the potential efficiency for uh, you know, preparing and delivering uh, educational courseware uh, for students. So, there's obviously a lot of exciting potential and opportunities for AI, but that doesn't mean that there are things we shouldn't be mindful of. And there are certainly uh, many pitfalls in this space as well. Uh, next slide, please. Please. So it's probably likely that you've heard already a number of the kinds of criticisms or concerns that people raise around AI, and they are all uh, you know, very important and very legitimate things to be aware of. It doesn't mean they're insurmountable in terms of uh, the kind of school teaching environment, but they're things that we should be aware of and in fact probably lend themselves to um, a kind of pedagogical response that interrogates some of these risks in the use of these uh, these technologies. But definitely there's been a lot of conversation uh, over the last couple of years around things like uh, the kind of biases that can be inherited into an AI system, depending on the type of data that it's been trained on. So uh, essentially at, at a fundamental level, uh, there's already inherent biases in the types of uh, textual and visual communication that is you know, published and distributed. And as a result, that's inherited by the AI system if it's been trained on, for example, the open web, uh, the public web, right? There's definitely um, bias in terms of representation uh, across the, the broadly public internet. Uh, but even where it's trained on more specific data sets, uh, it's pretty rare to find a data set that is, uh, you know, wholly and comprehensively uh, representative. And so we need to be mindful that AI is not uh, kind of free from those concerns. In a similar sort of way, depending on the type of data that's being used, there is a range of other types of concerns that might come up, particularly around uh, the intended or unintended disclosure of private information or you know, privacy matters that might come out of uh, the type of data that's been used. There's also been a lot of conversation in recent months about the lack of transparency around the type of data that these large learning modules, uh, models, sorry, have been trained on. Uh, in particular, you've seen a lot of kind of um, concern from the artistic and creative communities about the uh, use of their material to train data sets. Uh, other industries also impacted in that space, but maybe are a little less vocal at this stage, at least, uh, around their concerns with that lack of transparency. At the moment, it's even difficult to determine if your material's been used 
in a generative AI, you know, to train a generative AI, for example. And I guess when you put these things together, they all kind of culminate in a larger ethical set of questions around uh, not just kind of what these types of technologies can do, but what sorts of things are informing how they're being developed, why they're being developed. Uh, you know, there's a larger set of ethical questions or dilemmas that can be uh, unpacked around the use of AI. From the copyright perspective, uh, and as I said, I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but it's certainly important to flag that there really are two major areas where copyright concerns are raised around AI, one being uh, the copyright around the material that's been ingested into the training uh, module. So what material has been used in order to train that and how was that done uh, and where, if at all, copying has occurred within that process. But similarly, there's also conversations going on internationally around whether or not copyright exists in the outputs of AI. So firstly, whether or not uh, any of the copyright of inputted training data may be infringed as, you know, as part of the output of an AI system, and equally whether or not uh, the outputs of AI are protectable under copyright themselves. So some interesting kind of questions there, and certainly uh, New Zealand having a, uh, a provision around computer-generated material puts it in a different position to countries like Australia, where currently the Copyright Act is, is silent in relation to those matters. Um, so in term, terms of kind of thinking about those copyright issues, there's definitely a lot of concerns, as I've said, that have been raised by creators. And we started to see this manifest into uh, a number of high profile copyright cases that are going on around uh, AI. In particular, we started to see not a lot, but a little bit of court determination as a result of some of this. And uh, it's really uh, difficult to say which way the development of doctrine around AI is going to go. We're getting different kinds of messages, to some extent even conflicting messages coming out of different courts when they're looking at and thinking through these problems. So you've probably seen uh, you know, headlines around some of these cases where courts have thrown certain things out uh, because they haven't been able to uh, establish that copying has occurred. Another very interesting uh, you know, uh, scenario that's happening in the AI space, which is probably relevant or at least of interest to education, is that while these copyright concerns are definitely there in terms of these platforms, a number of the platforms themselves have tried to address that and to give their users more certainty and assurance by essentially coming out and saying that if you are sued for copyright infringement for the use of an AI product that we produce, we will indemnify you or take responsibility for that copyright infringement. So we've seen, for example, Google has made such a commitment in relation to uh, Google Cloud and Google Workspace users that are using the Duet, uh, Duet AI product. Similarly, Microsoft has come out with something uh, around its Copilot product, uh, and OpenAI has also uh, come out with a similar commitment, which is called Copyright Shield in relation to the use of its products. The important thing, though, is you may have already seen a lot of these are being tied particularly to paid or premium users of the products. So it's not necessarily extending to free uses of the uh, AI tools, but certainly people who are paying to use them, uh, the platforms are increasingly saying, until we get certainly in this space, we will take on the legal responsibility. Uh, for that material. So um, it, it obviously raises some interesting questions for the use of AI within the classroom context. Um, it also raises questions around uh, you know, the extent to which these kinds of uh, emerging practices of um, you know, indemnity may or may not be useful to schools. Um, obviously, there's a lot more that we can say about AI in the educational context, but uh, I'll leave it there in the interest of uh, being able to uh, have a conversation about some of the things that schools are uh, dealing with. Okay, um, back again. Yeah, thank you again to the people who put forward some scenarios. So we have